Well, I would like to welcome everyone here uh, that are in PAC in person, and I know we have a lot of people online, which is also really great. And I know that some of you may not have been to Naropa before in some ways. Um, I can't tell if, it, raise your hand if you've never been to Naropa before. Hey, <laughs> one shill in the crowd. I don't believe you, Candace. <laughs> <laughs> but, but maybe some people online who have not been with us before. So I really want to welcome everyone uh, for this event. I'm Sherry Elms, and I'm the Associate Professor in Environmental Studies here at Europa, and I'm the faculty lead for the Joanna Macy Center. So every year, the Frederick P. Lenz Foundation for American Buddhism sponsors a residential fellow to spend the semester with Naropa. It's an opportunity for mutual exchange between the visiting scholar, our faculty, the students, and our community. So we're really happy and delighted that we've had Ruth Wallen with us for this semester and has been working on her project, Walking with Trees. And she's presented at the community uh, practice day already here and with the Earth Justice Day, and she's been doing things uh, in the local community here. So I just want to say a brief, brief bit by about her bio, I know it's been online, but she's a multimedia artist and a writer who has worked in and dedicated to encouraging dialogue around ecological and social justice. After working as an environmental scientist, she turned to art to address the values informing environmental policy. Her work has been widely exhibited in many forms, including interactive installations in New York, New Langston Art in San Francisco, and her artwork has been featured on websites, artist books, and she's done performative lectures in various venues. So her work is centered around walking with trees, bearing witness to their losses due to urban globalization and climate change. She's been active in the border region. She is a Fulbright lecturer in the Autonomous University in Baja, California, Tijuana, core faculty in the Interdisciplinary Arts Program at Goddard. So, um, her topic today is walking with trees and daring to love in the time of great fires, sharing gratitude, grief, and vision in story, image, and conversation. So I'm absolutely delighted. And it's been also just fun working with you, Ruth. So I hope that will continue. Welcome. So thank you. Thank you to everyone who's here in person. Thank you to everyone who I saw just a moment ago um, on screen. And I particularly, again, extend my welcome to those of you who were on screen. And um, this is your first time at Naropa. So let's start. Um, let's see. Okay, here we are. So let's start with a moment just by bringing ourselves into the space. Just start with a short centering meditation and just feel our bodies breathing. Feel the breath as it comes into our lungs, streams through our body, streams to our feet, touching the earth body, streams through our chest, opening our hearts, streams through our head, sky above. Feel the breath as it fills our lungs. And then feel our breath as it goes out into space. Please feel free to come in. As we breathe out in space, we share our breath with all living beings. Our 
breath nurtures our being. And as we exhale, we share with all living beings. And we're reminded how much even all of the particles that make up our body are constantly exchanging in the world around us. So as we breathe, I'd like to start by offering gratitude. It, it has really been a wonder for the last um, three plus months to be able to walk among the trees, to sit with the trees, to lie under the trees, from the cottonwoods, the willow, the ash, and the maple, many other trees that I have yet to meet that are just beginning to bloom, to the ponderosa and the dug fir and the spruce in the mountains. This image is lying under the great ponderosa at Bald Mountain, as so many of us have done following our teacher's example. When you lie under the ponderosa, you feel the gentle holding of the earth, the soft bed of needles, and the occasional prick of the needles as well, keeping us awake. And then looking up at the sky of the above, at the whirls of the tree, at the play of cloud and sun and sky as life unfolds. I'm grateful to be held in this living universe between earth and sky. I'm also so grateful for all of the indigenous peoples who nurtured this land for so long, including the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, and the Ute. And of course, I'm very grateful to the Lens Foundation and to everyone at Naropa who's supported my visit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, today I'll be doing initially a lot of talking, but then I hope we can all join together in discussion. Um, I'd like to start by giving a short introduction to my practice so that you have some sense of what I was carrying as I came. And um, then as some of you have experienced, I'll be doing two readings of some of my work, and then I'll also add a little bit of theoretical perspective, and we'll have time for discussion and sharing. So I come to you from the Southland, the, the southwestern corner of the US in San Diego. I'd like to acknowledge the Kumae, their unceded lands with whom I've walked, as well as the 17 other tribes in San Diego County. San Diego County includes ocean, mountains, and deserts. It's the richest um, biodiversity and the most threatened endangered species of any county in the continental US. It's also a semi-desert, and unfortunately, one of the first places of huge conflagrations. Um, the first in 2003, um, a huge fire that lasted for a week, um, killed 15 people, destroyed between two and 3,000 homes. Another fire in 2007, I saw someone on the screen that I knew had to evacuate their home. 100,000 people evacuated their homes, and um, the director of our Shambhala Center lost hers. We've also had many introduced be beetles, including this oak borer from Arizona that's been ravaging the coast live oaks, the shot hole borer, heating the willows, and of course, bark beetles. Um, actually, I was privileged to be one of the artists in the first big international climate show addressing climate change weather report, which um, was shown in all places of the museum here in Colorado, the art museum. And I remember that so vividly. I didn't go to the opening because I was trying to limit my flying and I knew I would have to fly through the area later. 
So I came and visited the show and was flying home as the 207 fire was starting. It was really horrific. Um, the streets were deserted, there was a curfew, and they were worried that the fire was gonna rush through a canyon. If it done, did that, it would have really um, obliterated a major part of the city. But I think even of my own blindness that I don't think I still made the connection between all of the fires and the fact that when I started working in 2010 looking at the trees, I was still thinking about future impact, not present impact, even though we lost, had lost the vast majority of conifers in San Diego County by that time. So I just thought I'd share a tiny bit from that exhibit. I was talking about suburban developments and all the ideas, it was called Preserving Paradise, um, interviewing different constituencies. And I remember particularly talking to Mike Stepner, who was a city architect and planner, who had created award-winning, been part of creating award-winning plans in the 70s. But then he describes the death by a thousand cuts as over the years, the traffic engineers felt that the streets planned were not wide enough, the school district no longer wanted neighborhood schools, but larger schools located somewhere else. The lenders said that they'd never lent to anyone like this and the home in this way and the homeowners. They understood the suggestions, but they had their own way of doing things. So there was only solar panels on a teensy weensy percentage of the homes. I mention this because it's still this inertia that we're working, that we need to work with and open um, if we want to make the kinds of changes that urgently, urgently need to be made. So uh, I also wanted to mention an exhibit in Cascading Memorials is what I called it of this early work in 2012. And I think that that was when I first came to a question that I'm holding and I know is important for many people here, which is the importance of grief. And many thinkers, including Philippe Arias, who's written an exhaustive study of a thousand years of mourning rituals, talk about how the predominant Western culture has tried to banish death almost in the 20th century by privatizing mourning rituals. And I think in contrast to how Buddhists have always worked so much with being present to death and how important that is and how important it is that we learn to grieve pub publicly. And grief and love are so intertwined. When we lose the ability to grieve, we lose the ability to love. It's a kind of flatlining of the soul. And grief is also an opening to vision in any public ritual or any work I've ever done, there's always an opportunity for then people to share their visions. Another um, bit that I wanted to bring to the table was work that I was privileged to do with scientists in Scripps starting I think in 2016. Scripps Institute of Oceanography is one of the centers of climate change research, as is Boulder, Colorado, which I'm told has more climate scientists or more climate scientists per capita than anywhere in the world. So working with climate scientists, what I decided to do was take models of future climate and in the form of tree rings. So I had to um, think of what indices of climate would be useful. You need something that um, both addresses temperature, which we know is rising, and rainfall because it's the combination of the two that affects trees. Um, for the Torrey Pine, I used soil moisture because it was readily available data from David Pierce, who I'm really grateful for. So what I did is as the tree, for every 3% change, the rings got closer together. So you can see how much closer. This I hope the image looks better online because I see it's all jagged on the screen. But um, the rings, so it's a little hard to tell, but it, the rings are getting closer and closer together. Um, now this is for the enlightened government scenario, which means that we, the government finally gets, starts acting in a way that we have not yet to date. This is the business as usual scenario. 
Do you see how much smaller the tree is? Yes, if there are any scientists in the room, it is true that as trees age, the rings are closer together anyway. I am not accounting for that. But this still gives you a graphic indication of the fact that it's, we're living in, it's a tightening noose. This is another index using the Palmer Doubt, Drought Severity Index um, for trees in the mountains. And again, I'm so sorry that it's hard to see. I think it's probably fine for the people at home. But you can see the different colors and that the purples and the reds are much more predominant. This only went to 2016. In 2014, there was a severe drought in California. It was the worst in 1,200 years. And it's estimated that it was 36% worse because of uh, rising temperatures. This is what it looked like. Um, so I started looking at trees further north. This is Joshua tree. The main impact of the Joshua tree so far is in reproduction, but the pinyon juniper forests are dying. Um, this is at Walker Pass. Just imagine walking through a whole forest of dead trees. Um, I visit these trees every year. Um, to say a bit about the form of these images, you see that they're all done as photo montages. I do that um, to give you a series of glimpses, to give you a sense of fragmentation as opposed to the majestic sublime view. I also feel for me it's an act of love and reverence for the places that I visit. Um, in 2019, I've always worked actually with story and performative lecture, but I encountered Dina Metzger's essay, Extinction Illness, Grave Affliction and Possibility. And I, there was a call to write responses to her work, and I had just come back from my first trip to the Sequoias, which I'll talk about later. And I sat down, and I read the essay, and I dropped everything, and I said, I have to write. Um, since then, I've been writing. I just want to read a, sentence, a paragraph from her essay, contemplating the extent and pervasiveness of despair and violence across the globe, the increasing aberrance of human and non-human behavior. I see that all humans and non-humans know this. All human people and all beings, animals, trees, birds, insects, fish know this. All of us are being driven to some form of madness, pain, dysfunction. So I came here to explore all of this, to ask how Buddhist practice can help us stay with this trouble, to quote Donna Haraway. Not only to stay with the trouble, but make a relationship with the trouble, which I've increasingly realized from my first Zoom after I got here, and we, things were still pretty closed due to COVID. It was a Zoom for Tong Len for people from the Marshall Fire. And how do we relate in this ecological unraveling to death and impermanence? And how can we meet this not with closing in fear and despair, but with opening heart and with daring to love? So um, the kind of presentation I've been exploring is to write work that embodies all that I'm learning from the biological knowledge to um, theory to the experience of Buddhist practice. What I'd like to do today is to present two readings, and then we, I will present just a little theoretical background as well. The first reading I'll start with is a reading um, visiting the girdle tree. Those of you that were here at Earth Justice Day heard the beginning of the reading. I've shortened that, and um, we'll share two other visits to this tree. And again, for those in the room, these images are all a little oversaturated, but this is so that those on screen get a really good view. And I also have to just say that I feel like I'm just beginning to understand what's happening here in Colorado. So all of this work is very, very preliminary 
I hope I'll have a chance to share more in the future, and I will be here exploring for another few weeks. April 9th. Dear Tree, your yellow band caught my eye and drew me to you. I stood beneath the shelter of your branches, feeling your presence, and slowly reached out to touch the band, oozing with sticky sap, trying to synchronize my breath with yours. But the girdle all the way around your trunk presented your flow. Oh, tree, I am so sorry. The girdle around your trunk has sliced through your veins, your phloem, so that the nutrients can no longer flow up your roots to support new growth, nor can the sugars that you create through the process of photosynthesis flow down to your roots. Instead, all of your sap is dribbling down your trunk, your bark encrusted with your blood. There is no tourniquet to apply to this wound. You will bleed slowly until you die. Oh, dear tree, I weep with you. Your girdle is part of a strategy the foresters use to prevent the conflagrations that are killing your kin, including your relatives that have stood for hundreds of years. They have felled some of your neighbors, but chosen you for a slow death, so that you will stand for some years as a snag. Maybe it is all my own projection, but the sap encrusting your trunk feels like tears. And yes, somehow, I know that in your own way, you feel. Indigenous peoples have always known what Western science brought by the settlers denied until recently. It is easier to cut you down without realizing that along with the fungal symbionts entwined in your roots, you sense, hear, touch, perhaps even see. But now your veins have been severed. Sensations from limb can no longer reach your roots, nor can your roots communicate with your limbs. Even if I don't have an alternative to offer as to how you are being treated, I think it is important to recognize the violence of the severing of connections. I want to offer thanks, my sincere gratitude, for all that you have and will endure as you continue to serve your community, as you remain standing, providing shelter for birds and small animals, a storage place for pine nuts and more. Even when you fall, other animals or reptiles will find home and temporary shelter. Your log will hold moisture, gradually composing, decomposing, and eventually returning nutrients to the soil. So yes, taking the long view, your connection to your surroundings will remain intact. But yet, at this moment, the girdle that severs you feels like a blindfold, a constriction of view, the blindfold wrought by settler colonialism that has allowed indiscriminate rupturing of connections, the mindset that allows for the continuous extraction of riches, the mindset that assumes that the forest will always continue giving without humanity offering anything in return, the mindset of indiscriminate dumping of the leftovers without ever stopping to think about where they are going or the consequences to the air, the water, and the climate. Dear tree, the pain of your girdle continues to haunt me. Thank you, tree, for providing me a space to feel into that pain, that aching grief, and touch the vulnerability of my aching heart, naked heart. <coughs> April 25th. Dear tree, I am grateful to visit you again. How are you doing? You look fully alive. Your foliage is all green. You know, I now learn that despite the freshness of your wound, you were not girdled recently, but last November. Life processes are so much slower in trees. Perhaps the girdling cut your phloem but did not go deep enough to cut your xylem through which water flows up your trunk. Death will come very gradually, perhaps taking years until your roots are gradually depleted of energy. 
Walking this trail again, I realize how much work the foresters have done. It is as if they are creating several small meadows to minimize the fuel for a large fire and make the land look more like it did when the settlers first arrived carrying cameras. We, and I say we because I took this trip with Emily Takahashi, counted the rings on one of the stumps. The tree was 113 or 112 years old. By human terms, a good lifetime. For a ponderosa, quite short. Many of the stumps were of a similar size, some a bit smaller. At the turn of the last century in 1900, likely shortly before your birth, the population of Boulder was only 6,000 people. Now, the population has grown by almost another 100,000. You must have witnessed such rapid change during your lifetime. The temperature in Colorado has warmed by 2.5 degrees in the last 50 years. Maybe it's merciful that you are dying when you are. Dear tree, I went back with a friend to the burned area, the nearby NCAR fire. For, you that, for those of you online, this is a small fire that burned the end of March, way, way before one would ever expect fires to burn in Boulder. Um, so I went there to sit under the burned trees. In the periphery, the fire cleared the underbush, but left the trees largely unscathed. Moving inward, the fire burned hotter, singeing the needles of most of the pines. We sat in the charnel ground, a small rocky area of steep slopes where the fire reached all the way up the trees, reducing them to black skeletons. Foresters suggest that this fire was very much like a controlled burn, or the fires, whether natural or man-made, that occurred before the arrival of European settlers. We came to the charnel ground to relate with death. We sat in the blackness, on some of the many rocks exposed by fire, next to a weeping tree, its sap dripping down the charred bark. To the left, two tall trees, even if reduced to a skeleton of trunk and branches, still had so much presence. Many of these trees will be standing for a decade or more. We also came to learn about life, about the permeability of death and life. New growth literally unfolded at our feet. Again, for those of you in the room, it's hard to see. The grass emerging as curled ovals from the soil, brilliant emerald against the dark blackness. Throughout our practice, we could hear turkeys calling as well as the occasional hawk. Dear tree, if we opened our eyes, we had such a splendid view of the city of Boulder, houses like boxes tucked among evergreen green and deciduous gray, reservoirs glistening blue, an old power plant rising in the distance. In one moment, the fire felt like the universe's big no, to, spite a, to cite a poem by Trimper Rinpoche, mighty and wrathful in its destructiveness. In another moment, the fire feels like a cleansing, an opportunity, a demand to start fresh. Trees, what needs to change so that you can live, so that we all can live? What do we need to let go of, to renounce? What will we be forced to let go of? Scientists tell us that there have been more days of extreme fire danger in the first four months of this year than in any previous year. Dear tree, it is not easy to sit with a dying forest, but we recognize that unless we are willing to feel some of the suffering, willing to share our hearts, we cannot come into relationship with you. Unless we come into embodied relationship with the forest, unless we come into sacred relationship with the forest, it will not be pro possible to care for you properly. We are so grateful to be able to sit with you, even in the blackness. Dear Trees, April 28th. I realize that I've been visiting two different trees near each other. Perhaps it is better to address you in the plural to change the habit of focusing on the separateness of individuals 
All of you are likely connected via a mycelial network underground. Suzanne Samard even showed that plants share with other species. Douglas fir drying, dying from spruce, spruce breadworm, which is happening here higher up, share their carbon not only with other firs, but with ponderosa pine, the truth of interbeing. I went back to sit in the burn area today. In a time of ecological unraveling, this small fire zone provides a powerful place to practice, to hold the contradictions, the brilliance of life force energy, and both the tremendous creative power and destructive forces unleashed by humanity. As I sat in this charnel ground, I sat with feelings of fear, despair, and anxiety engendered by the blackness, and anxiety that is so much more potent after the Marshall Fire. Likely, a knowledgeable local companion would even have been able to see some of the burned area from where I sat. Six months of abnormally wet weather spurring the growth of grasses was followed by six dry months and ferocious winds. The fire was the most destructive fire in Colorado history, particularly shocking in that unlike other wildfires, such as the Paradise Fire in California, it occurred not in the urban wildland interface, but largely in suburbia. How do we sit with the knowledge that conflagrations like this are increasingly likely possibilities? Naropa faculty members Peter and, C Peter and Cynthia took me to their house destroyed by the Marshall Fire. Almost 20 years of love, of carefully tending to gardens and fruit trees, a lifetime of books, prized possessions, all reduced to ashes. They and their neighbors who were home at the time left quickly, grabbing scant belongings, not imagining that the fire would reach them. As all of you know, the fire was capricious, burning some neighborhoods to the ground, sparing others. Home hardening is certainly important, but in a blaze driven by ferocious winds, there is no predictability. Everything is subject to chance. How do we live with this tremendous uncertainty? But yet, as I practiced, I felt tremendous gentleness, surrounded by death, but also the beauty of new growth, of living earth. Thich Nhat Hanh suggests that we need to wake up to both in order to be a Buddha of action. My fear was held in the nurturing embrace of Mother Earth. Gradually, it felt safe enough to close my eyes and relax in light and the sound of gobbling turkeys. Slowly, my heart cracked open in love and sadness gentleness, kindness, compassion, love. It is only through the tenderness of the human heart that we can meet the enormous suffering of the world. It is only through the tenderness of the human heart which meets enormous suffering with love that humanity can create a future where all beings may thrive. Today in Tonglen practice for Ukraine, Someone shared a quote from St. Francis of Assisi. All the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the, frame, the flame of a single candle. Just briefly, a note about process. Again, I'm incredibly um, grateful to be able to bear witness. Um, shortly after coming to Boulder, um, I would, Sam Randall introduced me to Zen Peacemakers. And um, I actually gave a presentation for them yesterday on my walks with the Oaks. Um, and I just realized incredible resonance to their process and the three tenets. So just to share briefly, the, the first tenet which I add in following with Johanna Macy, is that we have to start by feeling the full vitality of the life web and offering gratitude. 
to that life force. And then from that we come to the three tenets of the peacemakers. The, um, the first is beginning with deep, and I'm this in my own words, in, with deep listening. And it's a deep listening without preconception, present to uncertainty, or in the words of the peacemakers, non -know, not knowing, just allowing what needs to unfold. And then it's a process of bearing witness. And by bearing witness, it means being fully present to feeling, welcoming embodied sensual notice, notice, knowing. And I just have to add here that it's the fear of feeling that leads to despair and psychic numbing. Um, shielding ourselves from sadness and from vulnerability is also sh shielding ourselves from love. And then from this open heart, the fourth step, I trust that this will lead to seeing with French fresh eyes, to quote Johanna Macy, to go forth and take action. As Thich Nhat Hanh says, if you see suffering in the world but haven't changed your way of living yet, it means the awakening isn't strong enough. So I'd like to take you on one more walk. Um, oops, let's just hold, let's go back if we can. Um, so I'm going to take you now to Sequoia, Giant Sequoia um, National Park, or National Forest, I think it's called. Um, when I first walked there in 2019, it was actually the first time that I ever met the sequoias. And I'd never imagined that the sequoias that I walked with would go up in flames the next summer. I'm going to just take you on one of several hikes I did there up Bear Creek. And at the time, I had focused on the broad vistas of the hillsides or mountainsides of the conifers that had died from drought and bark beetles. The sequoias, the most hardy of trees, were unscathed. And they were seemingly the last trees, trees that would be impacted by a changing climate. But then there was a story that I think all of you know too well from the Cameron fire, that lightning struck several places in August 19, 2020. Initially, the fires were very small, but then they became one huge, massive conflagration, the SQF complex, or Castle Fire. One day, the winds picked up and burned through 12 miles of carefully constructed fire breaks and fire retardant, um, racing through all these groves that I'll be talking, well, I'm just going to talk about one. Um, and by the October, it had scorched 22 sequoia groves and about 175,000 acres. So one summer, one fire, and over a tenth of the total population of sequoias destroyed. August 5th, 2021. The trail became steeper, the scene bleaker. The tangle of bare branches gave way to thin black charred shafts. Hiking over a rise, I came to taller poles. I imagined pines, fir, and cedar, but I couldn't tell which was which. One truck was much thicker than all the others. High up, stubs of branches jutted out to the sides. It looked like the top was lopped off, although a couple of thin blackened branches with bits of brown foliage remain, reaching upwards. I'd come to the McIntyre sequoia groves. Wisps of smoke wafted from the ground. Almost a year later, the fire was still burning. I stood in shock. A cauldron of smoke surrounded by towering blackness. And again, these are some of the tallest trees in the world. There was another sequoia near the smoke, actually two, the second behind the first. These two had many more branches, some still covered with clumps of foliage. I strained to no avail to find a hint of green, any indication that these trees might survive. 
these trees that have survived centuries of fire. To the left was another sequoia, completely black, the top of the tree blown off. These are the trees that survived countless fires, living for thousands of years. Now all that was left was blackness. When I finally found the path, I saw that it continued in the direction away from the smoke, zigzagging up the hillside. To follow, at times I had to look up at the slope of head to see which direction it was headed, at times down at my feet to follow the faint indication in the dirt, while careful not to step on the seedlings sprouting from the ash and brown needles. In places, the seedlings grew so dense it was almost impossible to avoid them. I continued up the trail, passing one huge sequoia that had shattered. The trunk was sheared off, revealing the brown, bronze interior with huge shards of the tree scattered on the ground. As I came to the edge of the ridge, any trace of the trail vanished. The fire had scorched as far as I could see. I made my way back down to the slope to where the tree had shattered and stepped off the trail to find a shard where I could sit, touch the tree, touch all of the death and loss on my in-breath, and breathe out soft gentleness and warmth. It was impossible to tell how old this tree was when it died, but many of their neighbors surely had been over a thousand years old. A thousand years. All the models of future climate only go to the end of the current century. Long past, I will no longer be alive. My daughter, perhaps, if she is gifted with a very, very long life. Imagine a thousand years of frozen winters, spring rebirth, and summer sun. Only 10% of the foliage of a sequoia need to be spared fire for them to survive. Looking up, a couple of the sequoias in the distance might have a chance to pass their wisdom to the next generation, perhaps live for another thousand years. But the earth is calling us to look down. The seedlings at my feet were less than two inches tall. Sequoia seeds only germinate after fire, despite those who say that the fire burned so hot that it destroyed all the seeds. Here they were by the thousands. Now these seedlings are asking for a commitment to be passed from generation to generation of human beings, to nurture the new generation of sequoia over the next thousand years. To nurture the seedlings, we must nurture the earth, honoring and repairing the life web. Hear this. In the midst of blackness, seedlings are sprouting. Seedlings are asking for a commitment to be passed from one generation to the next, to nurture them, to care for them for the next thousand years. How might we begin? Certainly refrain from cutting the remaining old growth or clear cutting any trees to preserve the integrity of the ecosystems both above and below ground. And as my mentors, Helen and Newton Harrison, have stated in their work, Serpentine Lattice, to speak for or make an active commitment to heal all of the areas that have been ravaged by clear cutting. We need to speak also for the sterile orchards of the Central Valley. Whenever I've driven through the valley en route to the Sierras, the air has been so choked with smoky haze that it's a marvel in that the center of American agriculture with miles and miles of monocultures of fruit trees that they can grow at all. Think like a sequoia. Think in tree time. Instead of using up arable soil in the next 50 years, imagine nurturing it for the next thousand. Instead of extracting carbon and burning it in the atmosphere, it can be stored in the soil. Instead of poisoning the earth and water, waterways with pesticides and fertilizers and rupturing the soil fa fabric with periodic tilling, releasing more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we must enrich the soil with compost, mulch, 
and a variety of ground cover plants that increase soil carbon. Instead of sterile monoculture, reforesting with a diversity of native species or intercropping trees with a variety of plants allows each to contribute to the complex whole, adding minerals, fixing nitrogen, improving soil composition, or providing habitats for the natural enemies of pests. From backyards to small farms, of which there are so many in Denver and Boulder, to the commercial agriculture of the Central Valley, and I meant to say in Denver and Boulder, to the commercial agriculture of the Central Valley, the trees are asking that we make this commitment. As I've shared before, so many of the speakers at the recent CWA conference at the University of Colorado shared with us that the knowledge is there. It is the commitment that is lacking. Just to add a coda, I have to say that the trees are crying with ever increasing urgency. On the way home from that tip, trip last summer, I stopped at the trail of a hundred giants in Long Meadow, wanting, even if briefly, to walk among healthy sequoias. I also was hoping and planning to visit the sequoias at Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park later last summer. I had first walked with them in 2020, just as the fire that I talked to about was beginning to burn. But before I could make the trip, two new fires, the Windy and KMP complex, were burning the portions of Sequoia National Park that I visited in 2020, and also burning Long Meadow Grove. It's estimated that in these past two summers, 13 to 19 percent of all living sequoias have burned. So I'd like to also take a moment to think just a bit more of what this iconic tree has to teach us. I'm taking you here, as you can see, not to a tree, but a stump. A stump that I visited before I visited the living trees in Sequoia Kings Canyon. This stump was from a tree that was over 3,000 years old. It was cut down for the Chicago World's Fair, cut down in people, in pieces, and so when it was reassembled, the fairgoers thought it was a hoax. Last year, I wrote about this tree in terms of time, imagining that the tree had stood before the birth of Christ, the time of still the thriving of the goddess cultures, but also a time of the rise of the axial religions, Buddhism, Christianity, and Judaism that all talk about transcendence. Um, but now I realize that looking deeper, it's also important that we think of the spatial dimension. A tree stands in space. A tree is circular. Their energy radiates out from the circle. Whereas time is future-oriented, it leads to thinking in terms of anxiety and fragmentation. I'm really grateful to Thomas Berry in his book, The Sacred Universe, for pointing out the importance of bringing back this awareness of space, of center, of presence, of completeness, serenity. Both ways of thinking are important, but the axial religions and settler colonialism have emphasized time. And so now we need to bring time and space into balance so that we have a wholeness. I have to also just share one other thing that was so ironic. The first crown fire that burned any sequoias was in 2015, and there were very valiant efforts made to save this stump. The fire didn't burn to the stump. So it's just very ironic that after its death, the stump has been so fetishized. So before I close, I'd like to take you to one more place. This is a place that many of you are familiar with, uh, Drala Mountain Center. Um, this is a view from Marpa Point. I really wanted to go here because it's a place that I visited for years 
um, tried to relate to those places, but also because it's a center of, of meditation for many traditions, of the, um, beyond, including Shambhala Buddhism. But it was important at the moment that I came, I think it was a very auspicious coincidence that the director, Michael, Michael Gaynor, was giving a lecture about feng shui and how the center was such a center of energy um, from all of the surroundings and, I, you know, and all of the rock formations that it was just bringing the energy, the sacred energy into the space. And it's this sacred energy that we need to connect with. This is a view from Marpa Point. For those of you online that may not be familiar, this is another view from the Tory Gate. Um, this fire burned, this center burned in the Cameron Fire, which is the largest fire in Colorado. Um, the fire did burn relatively fast. Um, there was a lot of prep work and thinning of tree, also a lot of firefighters. Um, so m many of the structures were saved. But I really see this as a center to come together and continue to contemplate how we can learn to relate with fire. So I'd like to just share a bit of theory and then we can have some conversation. So just to start by naming the trouble or the big picture to which I think Buddhist practice and all sacred traditions have so much to offer. I'm gonna start first with Jem Brindell who talks about deep adaptation a map for navigating the climate tragedy. And I mentioned this because I've mentioned it to several people here and they kind of go, hmm? Um, I have somewhat mixed feelings about his work, but he concludes after he's a scientist, after looking at a lot of the data, that societal collapse is inevitable, catastrophe probable, and extinction possible. And then he asks, does this need lead to immobilizing despair. And he says actually that he's found that in you, when you have supportive environments, when you create community, when you celebrate the ancestors, when you celebrate nature, that something positive happens. And this is what I think we all have so much to contribute to. He lists four um, R's as he calls it. One is resilience. What are the valued norms and behaviors that human societies will wish to maintain as they seek to survive? Relinquishment, letting go, what do we need to let go of? Things like neoliberal economy, individualism, incremental atomist approaches. Restoration, what can we bring back to help us with coming, the coming difficulties and tragedies? and reconciliation, what and with whom can we make peace as we face our shared mortality. I'd also like to invoke, and I, I'm sorry I don't have the slide, the work of Octavia Butler, in Parable of the Sower and Parable of Talents, and thanks to Ramon who led a four-day um, Afrofuturist festival here this winter, and in her work, Octavia Butler, it starts in, she's a science fiction writer. For those of you that haven't read it, it's writing. I can't summarize it in four points and do it any kind of justice. But it's so prescient to looking at the incredible violence wrought by increasing economic disparity. Fire becomes a tool of nihilism. Um, incredible autocratic government. This, and her work starts in 2024. But the protagonist, Olima, also offers a vision of Earthseed, the books of the living. She says God is change. And in the midst of all of her violence that's described so vividly and poignantly and I think accurately in many ways to what we are beginning to see now, she envisions a new society based on kindness. So it's again, how can we hold loving kindness in the midst of growing polarization and violence. And of course, I have to also invoke the work of Johanna Macy and the work that reconnects. So for a minute, I'd like to also just bear down on the, her second 
honoring the point and a little seeing with new eyes. And I want to say that she has contributed to Jim Bendel's book about deep adaptation and sees his first three R's as somewhat uh, correlated to hers. So particularly, what is challenging us in the collective honoring of pain um, in relinquishment? We've already talked about the problems in the Western world of unacknowledged grief to cite Joanne, um, Joan Halifax and the idea that we, could, that, we, that we need to reinstate rituals of collective mourning. I also want to name the growing awareness of the importance of healing collective trauma, particularly Menachem's worth, my grandmother's hands. I know that many of you are also studying with Chalmers Hubel. And I want to say something about repeated loss. Rene Lertzman has turned, coined the term environmental melancholia for those who are, care deeply but feel paralyzed to translate such concerns into action. And I think instead, it's really, again, important to realize that the pain that we are losing is active. So that active, if you have an active relationship to it, it's very different than relating to the passivity of environmental melancholia. And we can also look to the example of activists from the AIDS crisis and um, black activists actually even predating the time of Black Lives Matter to cite Catalina Mortimer Sandalin's melancholy can become a politicized way of continually acknowledging loss in the midst of a culture that in the case, for instance, of AIDS and black lives has failed to recognize its significance. And I think we're still, as a culture, and there are many cultures, but the recognition of climate crisis is still in its infancy. One other piece that I just want to put in is a notion of ambiguous loss. Um, this is uh, a diagram from Pauline Boss's book, The Myth of Closure, Ambiguous Loss in a Time of Pandemic and Change. She talks about many kinds of ambiguous losses. It can be something as simple as losing a limb or not bearing a child to societal losses, and she specifically mentions the pandemic, climate change, and the trauma of racism. And, you know, we talk about climate anxiety, but anxiety is a normal response to an abnormal situation. So instead of teaching, seeking closure, closure, how can we learn to sit with ambiguity? How can we learn to sit with impermanence, impermanence and uncertainty? It's something, certainly there's so much in the Hinayana te teachings in Buddhism. And she argues that by not teaching, seeking closure, it allows ourselves to savor or resist the parts of our, the, the parts of ourselves that others have influenced both positively and, and negatively because we're still in relationship with others. That we can increase our tolerance for ambiguity and that it allows us to be more fully rooted in the world. We see more than just ourselves in it. We think more of others. And then she has six guidelines for how to, f how to work with increasing resilience to live with loss. I just want to focus on one finding meaning, which I think is so important. And I've already referred to. Um, Viktor Frankl actually talks about this as well in relationship to the Holocaust, that we can find meaning in making that commitment to nurture the seedling for the next thousand years. So I'm looking at time. I'd like to close with one final image and hope to seed a discussion about how all the ways that Buddhism and contemplative practice can lend knowledge to this discussion. I've tried to imply that through my readings I just mentioned a couple more thoughts here. You know, we have all the Hinayana teachings that really look at what Sakyong Mipam called the me plan or self-cherishing. We look at the three poisons of passion or grasping, um, 
aversion or, or aggression and ignorance, keeping our head in the sand. We work with renunciation. We work with looking at our minds as a grasp to emotion. And even here at the Shambhala Center, I walked up, this is a close-up of that black ridge that you saw. And again, the slide is a little hard to see in the room, but notice all the pasc flowers that are coming up. They were everywhere. The pasc flower is traditionally a symbol of rebirth, of grace and strength. I've also learned that it's a symbol of the tears of Aphrodite after she learns of her lover's death. So again, through the Mahayana practices of bodhicitta, I hear Pema's voice saying, stay, stay, stay. We can learn to stay with a hope, open heart, to touch our sadness, let it go into the brilliance of space. Um, I want to share one quote that I also shared in a reading I did for Buddhist peacemakers yesterday, Zen peacemakers that Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams, when she speaks of love, she writes that the entirety of our descended culture suffers from a severely atrophied, atrophied relationship to the most animating, enlivening, equalizing force gifted to the human experience. How else, she asks, could those with skin privilege live in proximity or participate in slavery, lynchings, Jim Crow entitlements, massive incarcerations, and more. So now we have the challenge of opening, expanding that severely atrophied relationship to love. We also can bring to the table Trumper Mbache's notion of enlightened ayatanas, of not shunning the sense perceptions but using them as a gateway to recognize the luminous purity of, light, of life. And I feel here is where the arts come in, here is where collective honoring and ritual comes in. So I'd like to just close with, um, again, some other words of gratitude, um, encouraging, in these difficult times, I remember Johanna Macy saying how excited she was to live in these times, to be able to work with these challenges. And as difficult as it is, let's have some discussion about what's come up and how we can all work together to honor the past flowers and the redwood seedlings that are sprouting from fires. So thank you very much.